Webster, welcome back to INN. It's been too long. Thank you so much. We tried to have one one uh, appearance every month around the middle of the month. I was uh, right. perfectly uh, happy with that. That was a good deal. Sir, you know what? I'm going to set that in stone. You just set it on the air. You tell me uh, you want the Tuesday in the middle of the month or the Thursday in the middle of the month. What do you prefer? Uh, I guess Tuesday is probably better. I am going to email you the exact details for the next year, which Tuesday it is. That's the middle of the month, and you're locked in. I, it helps me. I don't have to call you to, to get you on. Anyway, Webster, thanks so much. We had a wonderful time with you here in New York. You gave a great talk at the Left Forum. I already talked about that. Uh, our little coterie of people here in New York, you've, you're so informative. We, well, we learned. Our, we have a growing chapter, a yes. growing local of the United Front Against Austerity and its okay. uh, election arm, which is the Tax Wall Street Party, which is growing. And at that uh, event where you spoke on the same program there, uh, and and Joe Calhoun, we were at the Left Forum. We, I mean, with our sixty plus people there, we were well above the um, the average. As a matter of fact, we were sort of in the middle between the foundation funded poobahs at the <laughs> top, right, the Amy Goodmans that everybody knows about, and right. then the the average sort of. Um, you know, rather nondescript uh, left, sometimes meritorious, but uh, often not. That that were uh, sort of you know, you could see them limping along with ten a little outdated most of them. Yeah, uh, uh, the whole thing is outdated. Well, the, the institution goes back. Uh, the first one I remember going to was at Hofstra University on Long Island in 1969, um, yeah. in the middle of the Vietnam War. And that guy, the guy Stanley Aronowitz, who's now a professor of sociology, was the honcho then uh, and is now. But the main thing is uh, Amy Goodman. And, and uh, as broadcasters, right, anybody who has an Internet radio program like you, like me, I'm, uh, you, can get, uh, you can get World Crisis Radio from me. That's on tarpley.net. Once a week on Genesis Communications Network, you can get it from there. Power packed with um, well, information. What we're trying to do is compete with Amy Goodman. We're trying to deprive Amy Goodman of this uh, monopoly that she has on the left directed or progressive or even just intelligent, well informed uh, analysis of the world. Because the, the one big thing you have to ask in this area is are you the agent of a political party or a candidate that might? disqualify some libertarians and some new agers for that matter. And then uh, on the on the left is, are you foundation funded? Are you getting money from the Ford Foundation uh, or institutions of this type? Which, of course, under President Reagan's uh, the uh, uh, executive order 12333, that, that's really the privatized CIA. The, the CIA or FBI or domestic counterinsurgency of the 50s, 60s, and 70s was then privatized by Reagan into foundations, front companies, and other institutions under well, 12333. So we well, sir, I, I want to dive in just two, for one second, one, two, and three, I do three, this three. very cautiously because you, you have great things to say, but you were there when I was talking, and I tried to address this issue, too. I'd love to get your take on it, which is, okay, just as you said, certainly uh, the Ford Foundation happily uh, acting as a front for CIA money laundering and distribution to, uh, you know, various so-called, uh, you know, groups that would be leftist or, or against the administration. Uh, that's been going on for a long time. However, I pose the question, you know, we it's official now. The two professors at Princeton put out a paper. The United States absolutely is an oligarchy right now. So then my question to the audience, and, and you chimed in on it, uh, the Ford Foundation, named after Henry Ford, was Henry Ford an oligarch? If we are in an oligarchy right now, and Henry Ford was an oligarch. What does that say if a lot of our brethren on the left are receiving money from foundations named after oligarchs? Well, of course, he, let's let's just look at it. It's too complicated to do the whole life of Henry Ford. If you want to know the life of Henry Ford in an accessible form, very readable, I would urge you to look at a book called The Fliver King, Fliver is F-L-I-V-V-E-R. It's the old word for an automobile, a car. 
Uh, and this is by Upton Sinclair. And we know Upton Sinclair was a you know, muck, muckraker, political activist, ran for governor of California on the epic wow. ticket. He was a third party. End mm-hmm. poverty in California. And, uh, you know, this this had, a, I think, a, an important long-term uh, inca- impact as well as whatever it was uh, in, in, in the short term. You, we can say that Henry Ford shared the fate of many industrialists in Europe and the U.S., and that he evolved rather rapidly towards fascism after World War I under the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution, Mussolini's march on Rome, Hitler's seizure of power, the union-busting tactics pioneered by Mussolini and Hitler. And we have to remember that is the, the essential feature of fascism. It is to destroy working-class organizations and then systematically drive down real wages. You see all this in this in this Flipper King. So much so that Henry Ford had a kind of a personal fascist army, which were the uh, the goons, right? The the enforcers at his plants, and uh, some of the leaders of that group uh, became uh, uh, just justifiably infamous. But you can remember in a march. Um, Henry Ford's problem was that he could not control the city of Detroit, but he could control Dearborn. So the entire Dearborn apparatus was in his pocket, mayor, police, and so forth. So when the workers had a uh, a protest march, as long as they were in Detroit, it was more or less okay. But as soon as they crossed the line into Dearborn, Henry Ford had set up machine guns, machine guns. Uh, and, and uh, you know, people were killed, right? The Battle of Deputies run and so forth. And therefore, you know, if you look at people like Walter Ruther and the other leaders of the United Order Workers, that is a stirring chapter of mass struggle. I know right-wingers just can't understand this, right? They just don't get it. But uh, the course of human progress, the building of a middle class, things you take for granted, right? An eight-hour day. Five Things we used week. to take for granted. Well, you, I think you ought to take them granted uh, for granted today. In other words, those are your economic rights, and don't let Ron Paul or Rand Paul tell you you don't have them. Uh, the so the idea is no market ever delivered those benefits. You didn't get an eight-hour day or a five-day week or a minimum wage. <laughs> Child labor laws. Let's let's look at that. We have this guy Mike Lee, right, the Mormon senator from. Uh, from uh, from from Utah, he says child labor laws are unconstitutional. Right? So, what does he want to go back to? Dickens? Are we going to start sending children down into mines to pull carts full of coal? Uh, Maybe he has too many children. Maybe he has got uh, you know several wives and lots of uh, progeny, and he wants to put them to work. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, is this an he echo? Made, he made what you're talking about? The fundamentalist LDS. Yeah. Listen, hey, I'm, 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 I'm asking Ford. you a question here. You know, what you're saying yeah, about I'm Henry be, Ford, is this an answer. echo of Andrew Carnegie and the Pinkertons even before that? There is this, this problem, right? This is, this is always going to be uh, the, the problem of class struggle in society. And by the way, there is class struggle uh, in, in Plato's sense. There's always Plato or Machiavelli. You can read uh, Plato's Republic, and they, he talks about the problem of a ruling class, and the, the point of that being that if it's an oligarchy, it is a class that rules and not uh, individuals. So whenever you have power massed together like that with the motive of greed and aggrandizement, you're going to need some powerful countervailing forces, right? The, the balance of power in society is just as important as it is on the international Stage. So uh, one way is uh, is to have a government that responds favorably to mass concerns rather than big money concerns, and certainly we we do not have that at the present time. But things could get worse. And if you look at um, Mike Lee saying that child labor regulations are unconstitutional, you look at uh, Ron Paul telling you you do not have a right to health care because that belongs to somebody else. Uh, or, you know, Little Rand. Little Rand has now flipped on uh, thrones. He's now in favor of thrones. Did you, did you catch that? 
Uh, I'm not surprised, but, uh, you know, all of it, health care. Oh, it's a big deal. Well, I'm, I'm, we got to do justice to that. Well, it's we just, can, but you know what? The music off. means we're going on break, Dr. Tarpley, okay. so please hold on. Okay. Uh, Webster Griffin Tarpley, friends, in the house, tarpley.net. All right, if you go there, you get it all. Uh, Webster's weekly radio program, which is very, very powerful. You'll hear this radio program and all the other appearances Dr. Tarpley has made on INN World Report. If you go to tarpley.net, as well as his many fascinating writings, we're going to be back with Dr. Tarpley right after this top of the hour break. Hey, good friends. Usually I, you know, I let the music play. Not tonight. Not with the guests like Webster Griffin Tarpley, who's on the line. We're going to get right back to it. Webster Tarpley online, tarpley.net. If you haven't gone there yet, why? It's power packed. Great information. You know, go there, take a look. Maybe I'm totally out to lunch, and then you don't have to go there anymore. But I, I think you'll find there's lots of good information there. His weekly radio shows are there. Every appearance he's ever made on INN World Report Radio is there, if you ever missed any of them. And lots of other good information as well. Now then, um, Dr. Let, Dr. Let Tarpley, just- two things. First of all, you know, all this high-flying theoretical talk is great. A, can we get down to specifics? Can we talk about some people who we are can, actually can, committing first, themselves, running, running for what Senate? What we talking about is just to complete this other point, right? The people in the U.S. ruling class, large industrialists, bankers, and others, virtually all of them were pro-fascist between the two world wars in the sense of supporting Mussolini, advocating Mussolini's union-busting methods. And... I would say a good third to a half of them were also strongly pro-Hitler. And the the people who have funded the libertarian movement uh, were, during that interwar period, were in this fascist to Nazi camp because this was their means of approaching uh, organized labor in the midst of an organized labor upsurge. So what you see, the Ford Foundation represents a widespread recognition in the U.S. ruling class that after World War II, after the defeat of Hitler, they had lost their reference point in the world. They had to change their counterinsurgency methods. So they they did a reversal of the ideological fields in many cases. And from being right-wing goon squads, they flipped and became left-wing social engineering, sociology-guided counterinsurgency foundations. And the Ford Foundation is, of course, uh, one of them. But we also know the Koch brothers helping to create the Cato Institute, what is called libertarianism today. In other words, the world of the Baltards and the rest of it. That comes out of the Cato Institute, originally funded by the father of the Koch brothers, who was an ardent admirer of Mussolini and of Italian fascism. So you can see how this this evolution goes. So that's the you're, answer. You're, you're talking about the Frankfurt School, the Fabian Socialists, sort of the left side of the oligarchy, no? Well, those, of course, are, uh, are, are you know, they, they contribute, right? They're, they're a large part of the sort of postmodernist uh, doctrine. And you could see at this left forum, right, there were, there were still some uh, residues, right? Herbert Marcuse in 1968 was chosen by these people to be the philosopher of wrecking the uh, anti-war student movement upsurge of 67 to 68. We have such people today. There's this guy called Zizic uh, from uh, somewhere, I guess, Serbia, I guess, in the former Yugoslavia. There are purveyors of Frankfurt School doctrine still around today, and some of them are clowns. I think Zizic would probably qualify as a clown, but there are, they're there, and they, they have sort of merged with the French psychoanalytic school of Lacan, Foucault, uh, and other sort of structuralist neo-Freudians. So you get this kind of a, 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 a toxic soup of uh, charlatans and wordmongers and uh, kind well, of... All being paid by the- foundations or whatnot, you know, to write and talk. Yeah, exactly. L- sure. Listen, let me ask you a serious question here. You know, you raise a very fascinating point. Yes, Henry Ford. You know, there was a gr- there was a book we reviewed years ago when it first came out here on INN. Henry Ford and the Jews. You know, Adolf Hitler kept books of Henry Ford's in his waiting room to give out to people for free. You know, from his Lansing, Michigan op-eds and so forth. But let me ask you something. Yes, a lot of the American uh, plutocrats, uh, you know, eugenicists and so forth, they love Wall Streeters. They loved Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, as you aptly point out. But tell me, 
Really, they loved him against, of all things, not just labor unions and all, but the but but Soviet communism wasn't Soviet communism, uh, the product of the British. And and is this a divergence? How do you balance these two things out? The British loved wrecking Russia with the commies, and uh, the Americans loved uh, wrecking the commies with the fascists. Uh, you have to note first of all. The uh, the coming of Lenin uh, to uh, to St. Petersburg, right to Leningrad, uh, in uh, 1918, is accomplished by the German general staff. And I would point to two people there: Field Marshal von Hindenburg and General Ludendorff were the ones who adopted a policy of fomenting revolution, any kind, in the areas east and south. Of Germany, and the important reason to name those two is that they are also the founding fathers of Ukraine. Ukraine being created in early 1918, uh, and this Lenin had already been there since 1917. Uh, but in early 1918, the nation of Ukraine was internationally recognized for the first time by Austria Hungary and by Germany and by the Ottoman Empire. And I think also by Bulgaria, uh, and that's those. That was the Central Powers, and that was the German-led uh, coalition. And the, so that uh, sounds very reminiscent of every time there's a coup in in uh, Venezuela, the United States jumps forward and recognizes yeah, the this, new government. That's all well known. This is not well known. In other words, most people do not know that the founding fathers of Ukraine were Ludendorff and Hindenburg, and the, right. the reason I, they did it, what I, they wanted out of the deal, was. One million tons of grain, 400 million eggs, 50,000 tons of bees, manganese, linseed oil, and on and on and on. So Ukraine is an artificial state. It is not a real historical nation. It never appeared on the map as any kind of independent country or even a political subdivision until uh, 1918. So those are, they, brought, they brought Lenin in. Then we have a phase where the British... Uh, there's a there's a very turbulent phase where you have white armies, a lot of them based in Ukraine, right? The Denikin, Vrangel, Kolchak, Kornilov. The Czechs went in there too, right? Sorry? The Czechoslovakians went in there too. Yes, the lost there's a whole Czech- story with that. Right? Right. I'm trying to keep it bare bones, though, because if you want to get detailed, we'll never finish. Go ahead. So the, 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 the point of this being is that, that Ukraine was the nest of of all of these uh, white armies on the lower Don, right? So this is what we're, what we're seeing right now, right? The Donets and so forth. However, here's the big difference. When fascism or Nazism took over a country, the ruling class was not disturbed. And the ruling class means bankers, nobility, oligarchs, big industrialists, uh, you know, rich people who control... The king production. in Italy? The king in Italy? The king, the king remained, right? The, and yes. the, the entire ruling class was undisturbed. Similarly, in Germany, even with Hitler, as long as you didn't scheme against uh, the Nazi party and try to interfere with Hitler's rule, you were left, uh, everything was left uh, intact, because by that time there was no more monarchy in, um, in, in Germany. The difference, though, is when the communists come to town, they quite often exterminate these parasitical, oligarchical ruling classes, right? A, mon- a monarchy would not tend to survive very long under uh, communist rule, right? Not, not uh, any, any length of time. Not in so, Russia, not in China, not in Tibet, not anywhere, right? Well, you know, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Romania, these are all monarchies, right? So, and then they come to an end. So this, this is the point. And there's, there is this, this is a very important difference. And the other difference is you can say, when Germany gets through with Hitler in 1945, the place is a, it's a ruin. It's a, it's a rubble field. The difference is that in the Soviet case, right, with the five year plans, Stalin and company managed to modernize the country, uh, in a, in an unprecedented way. So that they come out of it with a full set modern economy, with modern steel, modern chemicals, modern electricity generation, modern uh, education, class. 
Hello? Hello, yeah, I said modern education. It, that, that stuff had to happen because dumb people got a chance to go to school. I know lots of Russians who were educated in that system. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's one of the hallmarks of communism is that even yes. secondary education becomes accessible to yes. the sons and daughters of workers, which it certainly uh, was not before. So it is not the case that Hitler and Stalin are on the same level. And I mean, if you're Franklin D. Roosevelt and you come along and you've got to choose with whom are you going to ally – there's another very important consideration, is that Hitler was on a mad rush to expand. In other words, it's one aggression after another, right? Never ending, right, until he stopped. Be- precisely because he has no natural resource base. He's got no oil. He's got any number of other things that he simply lacks. He, he doesn't have the nickel of uh, Petsamo there in northern Scandinavia. Whereas with Stalin, you're dealing with a country that has a broad, secure natural resource base, so they can afford to take the long view, uh, and they do. But now I got We got to move along. Can I just propose that we leave uh, Europe and come back home? I'd, I'd actually go to Nebraska. Tarpley, uh, Webster. If it's home, if it's Europe, if it's down the street here in Brooklyn, whatever, it's going to be interesting. Your perspective, okay. and that's not a sick of fan talking, friends. Uh, you know. I'll, I'll I'll hit him hard if I think he's uh, off base, but please go ahead, go go, and you know I'll do that, don't you, Webster? Look, uh, I, I want people to think back and and, and look at it as, as a bit of a detective uh, story. Um, the U.S. ruling class habitually grooms a favorite candidate each uh, four-year cycle, or perhaps I should say, candidates. Uh, because uh, the favorites that they have are generally paired with a spare candidate. Um, it comes along, so they have they have a candidate that represents the Wall Street combination, but they vary the geographical, ideological, personal. Uh, they now they do color, they do gender, they do national origin, they do all sorts of things. Um, the one. Very well documented uh, cases. Jimmy Carter. If you get my book, um, Obama: The Postmodern Coup, I do a whole comparison of Carter and Obama as parallel lives. Right, but the, the trick is this: uh, we have Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, David Rockefeller's appointed manager of the Trilateral Commission, who tells us that when it was clear about 1975 or 76, it was very likely that the Republicans would be voted out because of Vietnam, Watergate, because of Ford's pardoning Nixon, the wave of revulsion, which you could see then in the 1974 uh, congressional elections, right, when the Republicans fell like uh, like ten pins. The, the ruling elite could see that uh, it would not be possible to govern through a Republican puppet president. So therefore, they thought of a Democratic puppet president, and they wanted to get somebody very far away from Washington, and they wanted to get somebody, they thought, from the South, the Southern governor, because that was a, a, a field which they had not cultivated for all the time, really, since the Civil War. You had Democratic presidents. And it's kind of like Woodrow Nixon goes Wilson. to China, right? You got to get somebody from the belly of the beast. You know, ha, I'm Jim McCarter. You know what else they decided at that very same time, I think, uh, Webster, that was crucial? They also ended the draft. And yeah, I think that was. I'm going to focus on the power question because I want to get you to Nebraska, okay? Yeah. We're going to go to Nebraska when we come back from the break, friends. But I submit to you, Webster, that uh, re, re, you know, concentrating power, uh, ending the draft had a lot to do with that. Good friends, welcome back. You know, somebody just emailed me asking who uh, performed this song. It's a group named Brad. It's a great song, Needle and Thread. And that's what we're all going through this country. We're hanging by a needle and thread. But let's go back to our guest, Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley. Uh, Dr. Tarpley, you know, it's all great. Uh, I think this historical perspective on right, left, phony baloney, you know, they, they put the characters in that they want is great. Uh, please wrap that up and let's go to, let's go to, let's go to Nebraska. Now, but listen. The point of this is I'm trying to show people that there is this well-established pattern of the ruling class grooming people who come out of unexpected quadrants, right? They come out of nowhere, as people said with Carter, and nevertheless, they are the chosen vehicle 
of Wall Street. And I just a couple of other peculiarities, if I could just develop this idea. With Carter, he obviously filled the bill as a Southern governor, as Brzezinski wrote, right? He was somebody who was interested in the Trilateral Commission. He was a Southern governor. Another important thing about them is they want people who are mentally damaged. Carter had been through nervous breakdowns. He disguised this as a born-again Christian experience, but he was somebody with a great deal of mental instability. He was paired with a spare Carter, who was Governor Reuben Askew of Florida, which uh, the guy, this is a guy that the Brzezinski also writes about. So that's how they did that one. Then, of course, by the time of the late Bush administration, because of the World Economic Depression, based on derivatives, which Bush had helped to unleash, because of the hatred uh, in large parts of the population, because of the Afghan and Iraq war, it was clear the Republicans were a very bad bet for 2008. So in this case, what I've shown, and this is, these are my books, Obama, the Postmodern Coup, and Barack H. Obama, the Unauthorized Biography, these groups around Spignu Brzezinski and Samuel Huntington had prepared Obama as a surprise candidate, right? The first black president, then that gave them, you know, a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, demagogic uh, potential. Obama was paired with Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts. In other words, if Obama had overdosed or God knows what, gotten arrested, they could have they could have fallen back on Deval Patrick. So the idea is a very um, highly educated, preppy. Ivy League black guy, but uh, post-racial. In other words, not uh, you know a warm uh, race monger in the sense you might say uh, Al Sharpton or, so, or somebody like this is right. And, and, and I'm going to jump in milder. just in time to introduce U.S. Africom. Go ahead. Uh, yes, but that's that's after he gets elected. We're trying to focus on how do they get these people in because that's the first problem. Then, of course, they're designed. Yes. That with Obama, and I wrote this, right? This is all over that book, Obama, the Postmodern Coup, that he's going to be the guy who leads the fight of the U.S. to kick the Chinese out of Africa, right? And that's that's the, the goal, against the Chinese to reassert U.S. imperialism. Now, 